I'm going to do not exactly what Igor says, apart from ending at the right time, because I'm not going to talk about um, what I often do talk about, which is kind of my motivation and working practice. Instead, what I'm going to talk about is much more about the craft of making animation. Um, so I'm going to be talking about more technical issues relating to animation, more than the ideas that drive animation. Although it's also true to say that, um, you know, I do have, um, I am driven quite a lot by the technology of film, as you're going to find out. I find that very interesting. And what's interesting to me is um, the intersection of this very, very strange invention, um, well, let's just call it cinema. It's, of course, it's multiple inventions and it's changed over the time, but generally let's call it cinema. So um, it's the kind of intervention of this um, cinematic apparatus with the world itself and how it makes us look at, look at the world in a different way. Um, but I'm going to start by asking a question that um, I'm going to partially answer in the um, talk, although it's a very important question that everyone has to answer for themselves. And I often kind of pose it to students and let them try and work out what the answer is. Um, and that is, when we, when we make a film, we show a film to an audience, how do we get the audience to possess our film for themselves? Um, just to explain it in a bit more detail, for example, if you write a book, um, or tell a story, in a written story, um, what the audience looks at is, the reader looks at, is a series of marks on a page. Um, and when we read, we tend to um, make those marks come alive. We understand words. But not only that, I think most of us, when we read, make images in our heads, either as we read or afterwards. So we kind of inhabit, um, in, we inhabit the story of a book by filling it with our own images. You know, there might be images from our past, there might be invented images, even characters, we, people we know become the characters in the book. And in that way, although everyone's reading the same story, and afterwards if people talk about it, they all describe the same story. The fact is that that story looks different for each person. So each person's kind of possessed the book in an individual way. Now, if that's the case with reading, when we make movies, we're actually putting our own images there. So how do we get the audience actually to possess our movie, to feel that the movie belongs to them? Because that's, what, that's what's important when we make films. We're trying to make films that the audience feel belongs to them, not to us. And so how do we do that when we're using images? How do we use images to do that? So I think that's a really important question. I'm going to try and answer it a bit today, or at least suggest um, ways of approaching that. Um, but in general, what I'm going to talk about is the smallest unit of film time, the frame, and uh, my relationship to the frame and what I learned by working frame by frame. Um, but to start with, I'm going to talk about the smallest unit of script time, and that you probably all know is often referred to in America as an American term as um, a beat. So that when you're working on scripts, which is something I do a lot, partly myself, but a lot, I do a lot of um, kind of scripts work with students and also young professionals developing scripts. And um, the smallest unit of a script is a beat. That's a small story event, the smallest story event. And a script can be divided up into a series of beats. And, there, and that's, that's how you get the term beat sheet, which you might have heard of. And often working with um, animation, I don't like students to make, or, or uh, um, animators to make scripts. Unless you're doing dialogue, scripts aren't very useful. So we often go from a story straight into a beat sheet, and from there into, um, a, into a storyboard. So the smallest story, story, uh, story part is, is called a beat. And um, 
the question is when you make film structure is you know getting the beats in the right place to tell the story so normally when people are working with film they um, when they're making us making their first story beat sheet or storyboard, they end up with two beats that actually mean the same thing in the film for an audience. So obviously you don't want that. Um, you get rid of one of the beats. And the other thing that happens is that um, sometimes there's a beat missing or two beats missing, so it's impossible to follow, follow the story because the jump's too great. So quite a good um, um, analogy or illustration of what, um, what a beat should be is like a beat should be a series of stepping stones in which the audience, you know, follow a path through to the end of the journey. And um, it's the question we have as um, authors is how to get those stepping stones in the right place. Because if you get those stepping stones too close together, it's a really, really boring walk. You know, your feet are all kind of constrained. You can't stride out. It's like walking up those steps um, that are the wrong size, you know, and you have just to take little steps to get up there. But if you, if you make them too far apart, the audience just gets lost and they can't find the next um, stepping stone and they're not interested anyway and they just wander off. And um, this is kind of aggra aggravated further in the sense that every person has a different kind of understanding of cinema. And if you work with children, for instance, the stepping stones have got to be closer together normally. So it's a very difficult thing to get right, and that's, that's what we try and do when we're planning a film. Um, the, other, the other thing I should say is, um, is quite interesting with comedy, um, because comedy, what you do with comedy is often you have the stepping stones unevenly placed. So you might have two or three of the stepping stones quite close together and um, another stepping stone much further apart. So just as the audience is walking along happily on a series of stepping stones, one suddenly it's not out of reach, but it's further away. And a lot of people don't realise that actually um, one of the reasons it's difficult, uh, especially for young filmmakers to do comedy, is they haven't got the confidence to leave the stepping stones far enough apart. Um, when, when, you're, when you're telling a comedy film, you know, it's really important how you get it right. And um, you've really got to trust that you know your audience. If you're good at telling jokes, you've got to trust your audience is like a group of friends, you know, sitting around a bar and you're telling an amusing story to. And that's very difficult to trust, but it works. And actually comedy is incredibly technically precise and people who do it well can get people to laugh about almost nothing. So after the beat sheet, um, we normally go into storyboards. And um, the, 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 let's say, leaving aside animation for a moment, for a live action director, um, what, what the live act, the smallest unit of film, just as a, for a writer, the smallest unit of a film is the beat. For a uh, film director, the smallest unit is the shot. And the shot might be a beat. A single shot could even encompass two beats of a story or five beats. But more often, um, a beat might require several shots to actually make that beat happen, make that beat clear to the audience. So um, uh, filmmakers, film directors work with, unlike animators, film directors work with shots, they put shots together to make sequences, and the sequences come together to make narrative. Um, and I'm going to go on now to look at the special world that we have, that I only, actually only came quite late to in film. I came to in the 90s after um, kind of um, 12 years of making live action films. I came to animation, and this is where my relationship to the, um, to the single frame started. But um, there's a little story associated to the word beat um, that may be an urban myth, but actually people are always asking, where did the word beat come from? And it's said that it was because when the um, kind of Eastern Europeans came to Hollywood to make movies um, in the 30s, um, they introduced the word beat, but it wasn't a beat at all. It wasn't a beat like a beat of a drum. It was just bit. 
like a little bit, but of course it was pronounced to um, American ears, it sounded like a little beat, a little beat. And that's how the origin of the term beat came. But actually it's a simple, it just means the smallest bit of the story. Um, so uh, when I began, I began making animation in 1992. In fact, this is my first film, a still for my first film. And it was um, a scratched animation. And um, I worked on every film frame so I drew 24 frames um, for every second of film. And um, I think it's a kind of special privilege we have as animators that we actually make the shot. And, and this is really a lot of what I'm going to talk, that we actually construct the shot. We actually construct the shot frame by frame. But a quick digression into um, frame, frame rates, frame running times, because um, where we, when I first um, began making films, the frame running time was 24 frames per second. But with the advent of video and um, because of the um, cycle rate of um, domestic electricity, it was convenient to run television at 25 frames per second in Europe and um, 30 frames per second in America. Now that amazingly and thankfully is all over and we're back to 24 frames per second. And 24 frames is great because it can be divided, you know, two into 12, it can be divided three and eight, it can divide four and six. So it's a really great, four, great uh, number system to use um, when you're working frame by frame. But I don't know if any of you know why it was um, fixed at 24 frames per second. And that happened back in the late 20s. And it's quite ironical in a way because when, um, when, film was, um, when film was silent, it was cranked by hand. Both the cameras and the projectors were cranked by hand. And it reckoned that the running speed then was around 14 frames per second, but it would vary depending on the speed of the projectionist or the camera operator. Um, but it was actually standardized at 24 frames per second because of the need to get good quality sound. Um, um, projectors and cameras had to be motorized. If you change the running speed slightly of image, you don't notice it. But if you change the running speed of sound, it's completely audible. It's, uh, you hear the pitch change. So it was necessary with the advent of sound movies to have standardized running times. And this was fixed at 24 frames per second, not because, of, um, not because of image, which could be seen very smoothly at 16 frames per second or even slower. But it was um, because you couldn't get good enough sound quality at that slow rate. So I'm going to say something straight away, which I'm going to come back to later. And that is, it's a paradox, really, that um, we don't require... 24 frames per second even, to see smooth, continuous vision. But actually to hear um, smooth, continuous sound, we need sound to be sampled at around 44,000 um, pieces a, a second. So um, image is at 24, but sound is sampled at you know, 44,000. So I'm just going to show you a bit of um, his comedy, the first scratch film I made, first animation I made. Why art thou gazing still? Why does thy sight still rest among the dismal, mutilated shadows? Thy time is short, and there are other things to see. Through me you pass into the city of desolation. Through me you pass into a terrible day.
And this is film of me um, actually um, working away. This is the um, me, little piece of me um, actually during the time I was animating this film. This is the scale I'm working at. And you can also see there that actually the way the film was made is actually scratching over an image that already existed that I shot beforehand and printed very darkly into the film. At this point, my life had changed somewhat and I was um, suddenly for the first time um, just making money from making this film. And um, I, I, it was also a rather good time. I had um, uh, two small children and I could say to myself, either I stay in London and sit in my studio or scratch this film, or else I go to the south of France and sit there and scratch this film. And so it was very easy to just um, move the studio, which consisted of a light box that I had in a Tupperware sandwich box and um, two rolls of film. Although I did, under I did find out that if I was in different circumstances, I would get different, different textures on the film, depending on kind of very, very minor um, changes in the weather would actually affect the emulsion and make, it, make the scratch marks different. Um, but I would kind of scratch every day. I, was, I wouldn't do it continuously because it's very hard on the eyes. I'd get up early and do, you know, 10 frames and have a coffee and then do another 10 frames and so on. And it was very strange because if I, one time I'd do a really good frame, I'd be really pleased, you know, it looked amazing, you know, in this size. And then I'd do a really, you know, bad one. I'd be getting tired or uh, lazy or distracted or something. And then I'd do another medium one, you know, so-so, maybe a couple of medium ones, another good one, and then another bad one. But the strange thing is, I never saw the difference when it was running. They all looked the same. So that's weird, I thought. And... Um, so it seems apparently that um, I'm sure if I made them all badly, the film would have looked terrible. But you don't see the bad frame, you don't see the good frame. So it's, it's a very strange thing in cinema that um, you can't see a single frame of film unless it's missing. The minute you take a frame out of the sequence, you can see a frame's missing, but you can't see a single frame in the film, in any film. This, by the way, is... Um, the scale of the work, just to give you an idea. You can see I prepared it specially for you so, because I used a, a yen coin as demonstration, Japanese yen coin, but it's about the size of a euro. And the, these are the frames, the frames at the bottom uh, and the side are 35 mil. And I did later make some tests for an IMAX film. That's the biggest size, which is the two big frames you see. So, um, going on a bit, um, changing a bit, I'm going to show a film that I made when I was a student. I, um, like many students, um, you know, you, you get hold, when you're doing an art course, you can get hold of a camera. And I did what most students do. And most of the stuff I shot, I guess, was like what most students do when they get, art students do, when they get hold of a Super 8 camera for the first time. You know, some weird stuff, some bits of pieces. But amongst this was um, this little film. So this is such a long time ago, I have no idea why I actually shot this piece of film, what gave me the idea, um, why I, I changed the frame rate, as you can see. Here's another piece. Um, this is what we looked like in the 1970s. This was considered cool in the 1970s, by the way. So um, I, in 1999, now as a, or 898, I guess I began it, uh, now as a kind of animator and known as an animator through having made these scratch films, I thought I'd like to try something else. And I remembered this film I'd made as a student and I'd never seen anything like it. And I thought, 
which is often the impetus uh, for me to make a film that I'd like to see more and to see what I could make with it. And um, I made um, Furniture Poetry, which is a film which, uh, in which a lot of objects change. You can see in the still, more or less, uh, there's some stills, uh, see a sequence of six images from it. And it looks like this when it's running. <laughs> So this plays around a lot with frame rates, frame rate changes, and you can see that the frame rates have a different character. I mean, if you're uh, people here who aren't animators, um, when, we, when we're shooting at 24 frames per second, we call that animating on ones. And when we're shooting at 12 frames per second, effectively, we're taking two images to make it run at 12 frames per second, and that's called twos. And if we want the the speed to be around eight different frames a second, then we're animating on threes and so on. Um, and um, each, to me, each frame rate has a different quality. Uh, it's very strange. Uh, and also they seem unfairly spaced. If you animate in this way that I do, it seems like the gap between animating on threes and twos is quite large, quite different. But the gap between animating twos and ones is like a completely different feel. It's like there's no comparison. You're looking at somehow a completely different, different sensation when you animate on ones compared to twos. And um, you can also see in these films um, how, um, how readily we see the change taking place uh, as movement before we start seeing um, the image as a still image. So we can keep on holding on to this idea of movement and then suddenly you hold a frame long enough and maybe it's, it's as long as half a second before people see that it's actually a still for a moment. Um, now the other thing I discovered, and I'm going to show you, um, Igor will be delighted because I did say that I would try and show this film but it's not finished, unfortunately, but I'm going to show an extract of it. So the other thing I found out is that um, things work differently to the eye at different frame rates. Animation works better at some frame rates than other frame rates. So um, this is a film I've just completing, which is um, shot in this church in Lucerne, which I, a friend took me to about two years ago. And it's entirely made of translucent stone. And the stone is arranged in strips. Um, along the side of the church. So that instantly when I went into it, um, it appeared to be film strips. And it also appeared to be something that could be easily animated because effectively you're looking at layers through strata of rock and you can see the slight changes. But the fact is it proved very difficult to animate. So I'll show you a little section here. You can still see it's not finished. It's from the cutting copy with the time code. But you can see how I needed to change the frame rate for the eye to see animation, depending on, on actually what was there.
So after I made, uh, to go back to furniture poetry, after I made furniture poetry, I um, decided really to play a game with the audience and see how much um, we could, um, uh, let's say, um, how much we could um, make still images turn into movement and also let the audience see that they were still images. So I modeled, made a film based on um, a very short cut down version of a 1941 Hollywood movie of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. And while the actors were watching the movie frame by frame, they got into position to act the characters. And again, here you can see a film strip from it where you can see that every frame the characters change. People don't get that the woman changes as well because she's very similar to similar looking um, actors, but you can see the men change. And this is what an extract looks like. So this is really strange to me that I could make a film where I just put, um, uh, that I changed every single frame. I put different people in that the audience can clearly see. And um, yet we're still seeing motion. We're still seeing it like a continuous movement, even though clearly some of, you know, some part, in some part of our mind, we can see that it's a whole series of separate discrete images. But at the same time, we can't help seeing motion there. And um, I'll just show you a little bit. Um, we, I also made a dance film at the same time, uh, or immediately after that, I made a dance film. For me. This is a uh, let's get the film. Volume. film is a trick. So like I, don't want, I don't want to hear myself talking. But um, here is, you can see in this, this is just an example of how both films were made. They were based on a movie that already existed and the um, actors in Jekyll and Hyde, in this case dancers, matched. And you can see as I do a dissolve here, this, this is just a making of movie, um, how accurate or inaccurate the match is. And you get this curious, by working frame by frame in this way, you get this curious, accidentally 3D effect because, because the forms are not filling the shape exactly the same way as they would be in a, in a, in a continuous live action film. They uh, means you slightly get the feeling you're looking round. That's what gives it the 3D effect. You're actually looking round the objects. And this is, so this is how they worked out. This was, all these films so far were shot on film, but we needed a line tester, um, a, well, a, a video assist, so the actors could see the frame and they lined themselves up in the frame. And the red numbers just keeping track of the frame count in case we lose it. 
and the actors get in position. I order them around, which is the role of the director. Again, you can see how, how they're fitting to the shape. And once they're more or less in position, I take a frame. This was the dancer who got the group together, and he said a very interesting thing, which I'm going to play. To put that intensity into every photographed frame of what's going on. But this was a challenge that um, we were rather obsessed, in fact, with me too. What really helped, though, in getting interested and obsessed with the idea is actually seeing these dancers frame by frame. What they're doing is they're exposing planes and aspects of their bodies that they would never intend an audience to see in real time. They're exposing odd back views in certain frames and legs that were not extending but sort of actually moving. So we were able to see something otherwise hidden. So this is, um, for me, really kind of something that a byproduct of the work that I've made and a slight digression is that because I'm often copying photographic images, I've made scratch films using, scratching on top of um, archive film. And I've um, also uh, matched, like in Jekyll and Hyde in the dance movie, I've matched with still frames. I've tried to match um, um, individual frames out of a motion sequence. How strange it is that we see, um, if you freeze a motion sequence, you see parts of the body in angles you never expected. And um, when I came to make um, a film, this is a bit of a spoiler for if you're coming to see my show, because I'm showing you something um, uh, that perhaps spoils the movie a bit. But when I made Lay Bear, this was a portrait of, um, of a kind of body uh, in terms of love in many ways, in uh, frame by frame. And there was a section in Lay Bear at the end where I wanted a head to turn through 360 degrees. And when it turned, um, we would see um, someone go through 100 years of age, but all in different people. Well, I'll show you the, the clip. So what was strange about that, the way I did that was that I went to, um, I, I would photograph people. I would go to people's homes with the same light, a black background, and I would photograph them. And um, I would try and photograph them. I knew where everyone should be. If you were zero years old, you faced the camera. And if you were 100 years old, you faced the camera. If you were 50, you had the back to the camera. 25 looking that way, 75 looking that way. So I knew roughly where everyone would be. But naturally, I took several photographs around the angle and tried to fit them together. And what was really strange about this is when I came to fit them together, even though I'd taken you know, maybe eight or nine photographs slightly different angles, I had some angles that were always missing. That was weird. And then I realized that what it was was that I couldn't help myself, but unconsciously, I was asceticizing the shot I was avoiding taking frames where, say, the nose just touched the cheek, so it, the, no, the side of the nose you know, was, was literally touching the edge of the cheek. The ugly shots I was not taking. And the only way I could get round this really was not to look at all and just tell people to move slowly around a slight angle and just click away and take many shots. 
And um, this is one of the reasons why, um, why hand-drawn animation is very different from computer animation. It's the motion there. And that is we're not inclined when we draw, um, when, we, when we make drawings, to draw ugly frames of the human body or whatever we're animating. We go for the, for the pretty frames. And that doesn't happen when you shoot continuous movement or if you allow a computer program to work out motion. So um, people often remark on the difference between rotoscoping and drawing, even drawing from life, a life model. And in rotoscoping, um, we literally copy the photographic movement, the film movement. And when we draw, we're always correcting, we're always kind of aestheticizing. Um, but that's in a way a digression, and I haven't got much time because I want to um, sum up a bit now about some of the things I've said try and make some conclusions. Um, and one of the things I, I would love to say, like to say, is the way I, I really, uh, for me, 24 frames per second is the speed that I, I love. I love what happens at 24 frames per second. It's a kind of vibration of film for me, this kind of movement. But I'm sure it dra drives the guy who does my sound and music completely insane that every time he has to make a film for me, he has to somehow deal with this vibration all the time. So whatever music, whatever sound he does, it somehow has to have fit with that, that fast, fast movement. Um, so I want to um, talk a bit about perception now. And, um, and the way the brain sees things. And um, we didn't know much about the way the brain works. And the first people who wrote about, um, made some conclusions about the brain work, the way the brain worked, were people who studied patients who um, had been uh, partially damaged, often by wounds. Um, and so particularly after the Second World War, this study of people who had, um, had brain injuries. And there's a very interesting um, case study by um, a Russian neuropsychologist called A.R. Luria. And he studied um, a man who had a, lost his uh, front of his brain. But the man could see everything perfectly, but he could make no sense out of it. It's a whole um, tragic story, really, about, um, in a short book, about this, this case study of this man who apparently could see things and perceive the world, but made no sense out of it. And um, A.R. Luria's conclusion was that, um, basically, the, the brain takes, um, does two things at once. It samples the world around. It takes a kind of, makes a panorama of the world, that's one part of the brain. And the other part of the brain organizes this um, in time, uh, has, is a temporal part, let's say, which means it structures, um, it's, it's structured around making plans and intentions. So he, and that's the frontal, uh, frontal cortex. Um, and that's what was missing in this guy, in this man. So he, he couldn't make any sense of anything but he could see it all perfectly. And he did tests to see that the person could see it. So um, to me, this is interesting because it seems like we're going a bit like towards this, um, you know, what we show the audience, because what we need to show the audience um, as filmmakers is we need to show them visual samples and we need to have them um, enough visual samples for the um, frontal cortical system to make some sense out of it. So to me, the frontal cort cortex is um, the story-making part of the brain. It's taking the images that we see in a film or in real life and making stories out of them, seeing them in time and drawing conclusions and so on. Um, so um, what, the, how often, let's say, how often we can ask, do we need to take samples of the world around to make this kind of continuous system? Well, anyone who is involved in money making um, in, uh, let's say, uh, around railway stations and where tourists enter, enter, enter countries will know that um, the hand can move much quicker than the eye can see. So this is the three card trick. 
which is great fun to watch and a very good way of losing money, where you have um, one odd card, the ace of hearts here, two black cards, king of clubs, and you have to follow where the ace is and where wrong there. But he's going to make it much easier for us now so we can bet more money. So just have a look at the ace, right? He's really pointing it out carefully. So you can see there, okay? See? Okay, got it, it's gonna make it really simple. What could be simpler? Put your money on. Let's put two. Damn, lost it again. Um, so the strange thing is um, that we clearly we don't we don't take many samples of the world. I mean we know that from film. We know that we can make movies on twos and it still looks like m movement. So clearly we sample the world around at um, a slower rate than twelve fra frames per second. I mean we can twelve times a second. We can make movies that work at eight, at. Um, at uh, some eight frames per second, we still see movement. So now people are thinking that movement is something that's kind of um, something that we learn, that's wired into us really at an early age. And in fact, even now, perhaps um, it's something that babies learn way before they really learn anything else. Um, I mean, it's, it's, it's known that in child psychology that babies to begin with, feel uh, or have the uh, power to conjure up their mothers, for instance, or their or their parents um, to uh, to them just by magic, as it were. But probably at the very early stage, um, children, young babies, begin to realise that the mother actually comes and goes. So when the mother appears to the baby, they have to learn eventually that actually when the mother isn't there there's been movement taking place. It's not a kind of magical appearance. And movement is so hardwired into us um, that we kind of can see it. I mean, I know animators who say, you know, they were very frightened when they began that they wouldn't be able to get things to move. In fact, it's very hard not to get things to move. Um, you can get almost anything to move, in fact, um, that are roughly similar shape. Um, because movement is very hardwired into us. We, we rather see movement than things appear and disappear. But here's an interesting thing about speed. Let's speed this up and see what happens. Moving very quickly, it's all fine. And faster and faster, still moving. And then somewhere something happens and the thing isn't moving anymore. So that's strange, I think. Um, that actually, um, when you move things very fast... What's happening there? You know, when I was younger and you looked at books about film, it always said that the reason why film works is because of persistence of vision. But you can see motion doesn't work because of that. The reason why we see the spots stay in the same place and become two spots is because of persistence of vision. You see an after image in the place. So that's not the way motion works. Um, So why do we, why do we um, sample the world so slowly? Well, the reason that's given by um, 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 neuropsychologists is really to do with evolution. And the, the brain takes, um, the brain takes uh, 20 percent of all the glucose and oxygen in the bloodstream, the human brain, to work. And vision, which is a huge part of the brain, of the human brain, takes 6% um, of all the food we eat is just consumed in um, vision, which means that if you ever want to lose weight, the best way of doing it is sitting on the sofa and watching more TV. 
Um, so what's happened in order not to, uh, in order to kind of make sure that the brain doesn't get bigger and bigger and we become like those things like from Mars, you know, with the enormous brains and we can't move around, evolution has helped us by making the brain parallel process. So when, um, so if you think of the eyes, the eyes are very much like a camera. They're, they're really a model. The movie camera is a model of the eye. But after that, vision is completely different. Um, the information from the eyes is sent to different parts of the brain. And the, um, the brain processes things like color in different places. And it also processes movement. And it's very strange that actually movement is processed in a different part of the brain. And although it's very rare, people can have that part of the brain damaged. It's actually here and it's in two places, so it's very rarely affected. Um, Oliver Sacks, who is a kind of follower and admirer of A.R. Luria, wrote a very interesting book, which is a collection of perceptual disorders called An Anthropologist on Mars. And he quotes a woman who'd lost the power to detect motion. Um, it's not a patient he had, but he, did, he reports um, that um, this woman was, uh, couldn't pour liquid because as she poured it, it would appear to be like um, a stalactite and then it would be solid and then suddenly it would be spilled. And she hated to be in a room with lots of people because it made her uneasy because people would just pop around the room randomly. She couldn't see the movement and she couldn't cross a road because um, one moment the car was miles away, or kilometers, I should say, sorry. And then next second it was on top of her. But she learned to cross the road because she could hear the sound. So it was an entirely visual defect that was missing. She, could, she understood time, but she couldn't see movement, which is very strange. Um, so I'm just going to give you an example to finish off with about um, how lazy our, our brains are and how much... It's a wonderful thing for a filmmaker to know this, by the way, because if you really know what people are looking at on the screen, you know, you, you can just play around so much. And if you know the way perception works, it gives the opportunity to, um, you know, to, to, to play, to know what people are looking at, to cut well, to animate well. If you've seen this already, um, please think back to the time you first saw it. Hi, I'm Richard, this is Sarah, and we're going to perform the amazing color-changing card trick with this blue back deck of cards. Now the idea is very simple. I'm just going to spread the cards in front of Sarah and ask her to push any card towards the camera. Right, okay, let's see. I'm going to go for this card here. Okay. Now Sarah could have selected any card at all from the deck, but she selected the card which is now face down on the table. What I'm going to ask her to do is show us which card she selected. Right, so the card that I chose was in fact the Three of Diamonds. The Three of Diamonds, okay, excellent choice. That card goes back into the deck. Now I'm just going to spread the cards face up on the table. Do a little click of the fingers. And you'll see that Sarah's card here has now got a blue back. Not particularly surprising. What's slightly more surprising is all of the other cards have got red backs. And that is the amazing color changing card trick. I'm Richard, this is Sarah, and we're going to perform the amazing color-changing card trick with this blue back deck of cards. Now the idea is very simple. I'm just going to spread the cards in front of Sarah and ask her to push any card towards the camera. Right, okay, let's see. I'm going to go for this card here. Okay. Now Sarah could have selected any card at all from the deck. But she selected the card which is now face down on the table. What I'm going to ask her to do is show us which card she selected. Right, so the card that I chose was in fact 
The three of diamonds, okay, excellent choice. That card goes back into the deck. Now I'm just going to spread the cards face up on the table, do a little click of the fingers, and you'll see that Sarah's card here has now got a blue back. Not particularly surprising. What's slightly more surprising is all of the other cards have got red back. So actually you can hear the sound even moving in the first one of the, of the things going. So just a last word to say is that um, I hope in some ways I've um, uh, addressed the question at the beginning, but let's just make something a little bit clearer perhaps to think about. And it's a mistake. I mean, the, the wonderful thing about animation is the control we have about the image that the audience sees. Um, the problem that animators often have is being obsessed with the image that they're making and not what the image that the audience sees. And um, I think what you have to realize when you're making a film is that you're making an image yourself that's to make an image in the audience's head. And when you show a film, the only purpose of the image up on the screen is to make images happen in the audience's head. That's the only purpose at all. And the mistake that I think a lot of people make is to kind of you know, forget that and think that what they're, what they're making on the screen somehow has, is important of its own right. It's not. It's just to make images in the audience's head. And that's not an excuse to be, make lazy filmmaking because what you have to do is you have to precisely make images on the screen so that the audience gets the images that you want. Now I have to leave that now um, because there's another masterclass coming up, which I've slightly run into. So thanks for listening. <laughs>